Buongiorno. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to be here. And within the next uh, 30 minutes, I will talk about um, part two of the new BBNJ agreement. So what is it all about, this part two of the new BBNJ agreement? Well, it is about the creation of a new mechanism for access to and fair and equitable benefit sharing of marine genetic resources beyond national jurisdiction. It is also about uh, digital sequence uh, information on marine genetic resources beyond national jurisdiction and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits of this. I will come to this term later in my presentation. First of all, I would like to have a look what are actually marine genetic resources. We all use this, uh, this term, but what does it mean? And when we have a closer look to the um, BBNJ agreement, we will find in Article 1 the definition. And it's called marine genetic resources, means uh, any material of marine plant, animal, microbial, or other origin, origin containing functional units of heredity of actual or potential value. So what we are actually talking about is material from bacteria, from fungi, from seaweed. You may now ask the question, but we already have international law which regulates the access to and fair and equitable sharing of benefits on marine genetic resources. You may think of um, the Treaty of the Food and Agriculture Organization. You may think of um, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the CBD, and its Nagoya Protocol. So, why is it necessary? Um, the C if you think of the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol, um, it is limited to areas within national jurisdiction. But now we are talking in the new BBNJ agreement about areas beyond national jurisdiction. And areas beyond national jurisdiction, as uh, André already mentioned, means high seas and the area, which is also defined in Article 1 of the new BBNJ agreement. So, there was actually a necessity for a new BBNJ um, agreement to regulate marine genetic resources beyond national jurisdiction and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits um, of them. So, um, this mechanism which was created in the new BBNG agreement is groundbreaking because it's not like one of the speakers uh, said, previous speakers said, um, like first come, first served. And until now, it was a situation that uh, stakeholders like continent uh, um, companies was not required to share benefits from accessing and using of marine genetic resources in areas beyond national jurisdiction. But now is, it is subject to this new part two of the new BBNJ agreement. Um, as you can, um, as you can. Uh, um, or maybe you, you, you know, the international uh, negotiations um, to this new BBNJ agreement were extremely difficult due, due to a lack of um, consensus on whether which principle should apply. Andre already mentioned this. Was this a principle of the common heritage of mankind or should it be the principle of um, the freedom of the high seas, part seven? and part 11 of, of UNCLOS. By the end, a compromise watch, was reached and um, the parties to the BBNJ agreement um, agreed um, that both principles should apply and uh, that the BBNG, agree, BBNG agreement should be guided by both principles. It's actually subject to Article 7 of the BBNG agreement. Now, you may ask the question, 
why are marine genetic resources at all are included in the new BBNJ agreement. We already spoke about the definition of the marine genetic resources. We talk about the organi uh, organisms which are covered, like seaweed, algae, bacteria, and um, so on. And as you maybe know, these um, organisms are subject to extremes of pressure and temperature and sometimes toxicity and in, in, in the high seas or in the area. And as a result, uh, um, these marine genetic resources have a unique molecular and metabolic characteristics that made them extremely interesting for um, industrial and commercial and also a value and also for uh, scientific research. So it's extremely interesting for the pharmaceutical, food, cosmetics, or alternative uh, energy sector. Think of medicine, think of biofuel. Um, but uh, the access and the analysis of these organisms requires expensive technologies. So it is not surprising that most of the research and patenting in this area or commercialization are carried out by companies and stakeholders um, of a limited uh, number of developed countries. And it's also not surprising that the developing countries um, do not pr uh, presently are engaged in these uh, research activities, but they are also interest, uh, interested in a, a fair and equitable sharing of benefits of the research and of the commercialization of the, uh, um, of the marine genetic resources. So we, start, as we spoke about marine genetic resources. We spoke about the areas beyond national jurisdiction. But there's a term in this um, part, two, part two of the new BBNJ agreement, which is maybe new for you. It's the term of the digital secret information. Abbreviation is DSI. This term is currently undefined. And also, um, among scientists, it, not, it, is, it is not used in a uniform way. It is used differently by different stakeholders. Um, it is a placeholder term, actually, to um, genetic sequence data, um, as well as all the data and information which derives from marine genetic resources. And for present purpose, uh, for the present purpose, um, you can say it refers to all immaterial, electronically safe data on um, genetic resources, which is actually stored in databases, which is actually stored in repositories with regard to marine genetic resources. So, you can imagine how important these digital secrets informations are. Because what you can do, you can create um, without having a physical sample in your hand, is it possible to um, create those uh, marine genetic resources, those information which are contained in the marine genetic resources based on the data you have and based on the data which is stored in databases and in repositories. So these digital sequence information um, got a huge awareness and had to be regulated in the new BBNJ agreement and in this part two. So this is why DSI with regard to marine genetic resources is already is also regulated in the new part two of uh, the BBNJ agreement. So, how is this new mechanism working? Um, it was a clearinghouse mechanism. Um, 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 it applies a clearinghouse um, mechanism. So, at different stages of both the collection and the utilization of marine genetic resources and DSI, digital sequence uh, informations, the um, 
interested parties will have to be notified of the, um, the, the, the um, involved stakeholders uh, has to notify about their actions, about the collection and also about the utilization, so which marine genetic resources they actually use. And this notification and this clearinghouse mechanism uh, will actually allow the monitoring of the collection and the utilization of marine genetic resources. Mm. This clearinghouse mechanism, how is it organized? It is actually an open um, access um, platform. It's a centralized platform uh, managed by the Secretariat of um, the BBNJ agreement and it en it's enables the parties to get access to this open access uh, platform to provide information, to disseminate information with regard to marine genetic uh, resources beyond areas of uh, national jurisdiction. So, wow, this presentation, you see there are so many notifications obligations. Um, the BBNJ lists in detail the information that needs to be notified uh, and needs to be um, registered in this new clearinghouse mechanism, um, this new open access uh, platform, actually prior to the collections of marine genetic resources. For example, you have to notify about sponsoring institutions, about the geographical area in which the collection is to be undertaken. Um, uh, the, it must be given an opportunity for scientists of all states, um, especially from uh, developing countries, to be involved in or associated with the project. Um, there has been a notification um, one year from the collection of the marine genetic uh, re um, resources to the clearinghouse mechanism with regard um, in which repository or database um, the digital um, information on marine genetic resources are, are, thaws, are, are stored. Um, uh, there has to be given a report of the geographical area from which marine genetic resources were collected and in so far available. Um, if the collected marine genetic resources are subject to utilization, including commercial products or processes, then you have to provide further, further information have to be provided and has to be notified as soon as it comes available. This is um, in particular um, when the results um, of the utilization can be found in publication or when patents were granted. Um, the question is, we have so many notification obligations. How will it be monitored? How is the uh, transparency given? And there is, a, I think, a great new technical uh, feature which was created. It's actually the, actually the BBNJ standardized uh, batch identifier, which is regulated in Article 16 of the BBNJ agreement. What is it actually? It is a tag. It tags uh, groups of, of all associated sequence um, information, samples, or products that results from the, from the um, discovery of marine genetic resources um, uh, beyond national uh, jurisdiction. So it gives actually the necessary transparency what happened from the beginning, from the collection, <coughs> until the uh, utilization or maybe the patenting of marine genetic resources with the help of this technical feature, this uh, BBNJ st uh, standardized batch identifier, which is um, automatically generated by the clearinghouse uh, mechanism upon uh, notification uh, on the collection of the marine genetic resources. So we have uh, the notification obligations, we have this technical feature, and um, we also have regulations on benefits 
on monetary and non-monetary benefits arising from activities with respect to marine genetic resources and um, DSI on marine genetic resources. What are these non-monetary benefits which has to be shared? Um, think, of for, uh, think of access to samples, think of uh, open access to scientific data, think of capacity building and the transfer of marine um, um, technology, um, as well as technical or scientific corporations, all these are non-monetary benefits which are regulated in this part two of the new BBNJ agreement. Apart from that, there are also, of course, monetary benefits um, from the utilization of marine genetic resources and DSI on marine genetic resources, including commercialization, which uh, shall be shared fairly and equitably through a new financial mechanism with what, which was introduced in um, Article 14 of the um, BBNJ agreement. So initially, um, the developed parties to the agreement have to pay an annual contribution to the newly established financial mechanism in the amount of 50% of and in addition to their assessed contributions. Um, the BBNJ agreement itself mandates the conference to the parties to replace this initial benefit sharing modality through other modalities. For example, there should be or there could be thought about milestone payments regarding the utilization of and the commercialization of marine genetic resources. Um, it could be payments um, um, with regard to um, uh, percentages of the revenue, revenue from the sales of products. All these kinds of possibilities could be thought about and are possible. And uh, this financial mechanism which was introduced in the BBNJ agreement shall assist the developing state parties in the implementation of the BBNJ agreement including um, uh, funding, the, uh, uh, funding, um, funding in support of capacity building and the transport of marine technology. Let's switch over to the, to the IP sector. Maybe you ask yourself, what about IP, intellectual property rights, in this um, new BBNJ agreement? I only um, mentioned that there is a notification obligation regarding patents which were granted with respect to marine genetic resources. In the BBNJ agreement, there's no further reference um, to IP rights on products um, that originated from marine genetic resources from areas um, beyond um, national jurisdiction. It were developed countries like the EU, the US, Switzerland, Norway and Japan among others that strongly opposed addressing IP rights uh, in the instrument. Um, it was said that the IT, IP rights would not be within the scope of the BBNJ agreement and should be discussed within an appropriate forum and um, there was actually um, a link to the World Intellectual Property Organization and uh, the WIPO and the World Trade Organization uh, the, um, WTO where appropriate discussions already take place um, for, for many years. Before I will present those discussions which are going on um, in the forum of WIPO and the World Trade Organization, um, just a few words um, of the patentability of marine genetic resources. Um, what are actually IP rights? I assume you know IP rights could be patents, could be trademarks, could be designs, could be, um, could be copyrights, so a patent actually is a monopoly right for a, a, a newly for a new invention of a product 
um, with is, with, which is industrially useful. So you may ask, are marine genetic resources patentable themselves? No, they are not patentable. But what, what is the, what's the possibility to get a patent on? If those marine genetic resources are modified through human inventions, through the application of biotechnology, for example, um, then it could happen that you get a new technical invention where you can get actually patent protection on. There are a few, or if you would have a look here, um, many patents regarding marine genetic resources right now. The number of patents originating from marine genetic resources has increased by an average of 12% per year since 1999. And to mention this, I have to mention this, 10 developed countries account for 90% 90, 90 of those patents related to marine genetic resources. So it's not surprising and consequently that developing countries would like to benefit to be shared more fairly and to equitably in those developments as well. So what's going on in WIPO? What's going on in the World Trade Organization with regard to marine genetic resources so that it was not necessary to regulate those um, IP rights in the new BBNJ agreement? First of all, what is the World, uh, World Intellectual Property Organization? WIPO um, is established in 1962. It's based in Geneva. It's a specialized agency of the United uh, Nations with 193 member states. It is the global forum uh, for intellectual property rights, which means, as I already said, patents, trademarks, designs, and, um, uh, and uh, copyrights. Um, it's a forum actually to, uh, for services, information, and cooperation. WIPO administers 26 uh, international treaties on IP, including the Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property and, for example, the Patent Cooperation Treaty, the PCT. Um, and these uh, treaties provide a framework for the protection of IP in the member states. So, when we have a look at, at WIPO, um, WIPO has an intergovernmental committee on intellectual property and genetic resources, traditional knowledge and uh, folklore um, established in 2000. And this committee deals with a range of issues concerning the interplay between intellectual property rights and marine genetic uh, resource. And one of the key discussions, or one of the center stage in the discussion, is um, a so-called patent disclosure agreement. So if you are actually um, want to, uh, or if you are actually applying for a patent, you um, have to disclose, right now, you have to disclose the technical details of your new invention um, to the patent office like, uh, like, like WIPO in, in, in Geneva. At the moment, it's not necessary actually um, to uh, disclose the source or the origin with regard or, um, to mar marine genetic resources, so the source or origin of marine genetic resources. So you want to get a patent on a new invention. You have to provide the details how this patent works, but at the moment it is not necessary to mention um, where you have, for example, or from which area, from which source, from which origin, or, origin you have the marine genetic resources from. And um, it is discussed, actually, that um, such um, um, patent disclosure requirement should, um, should be introduced in, um, in, the, in the patent cooperation uh, 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 treaty. Um, 
these disclosure re requirements are part of uh, very um, or various proposal since many years. It was it is also discussed within um, within the VTO and the TRIPS agreement, um, which is administered by the VTO. Um, it must also be said that um, um, because of the fact that there was no agreement yet regarding this patent disclosure agreement to be introduced uh, in the forum of uh, WIPO and um, the, the World Trade Organization, some um, countries have already adapted some thoughts of patent disclosure requirements. Those patent disclosure requirements where, as I said, the applicant has to disclose the origin of the um, genetic resources are in some, uh, in some countries voluntary, in some countries they are mandatory for the patent application. So there is no unique picture, no unique regulation at the moment. So for many years, um, within the uh, VTO and in WIPO, um, this new patent disclosure requirement is discussed. So surprisingly, the General Assembly of WIPO decided in 2022 that by 2024, a diplomatic conference should take place to conclude an international legal instrument relating to intellectual property, genetic resources, and traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. And this diplomatic conference, uh, this diplomatic conference will be preceded by a special session of um, this um, committee of uh, WIPO, which will pl take place next week from the 4th to the 8th of December. And um, there will also be a preparatory committee um, uh, on the diplomatic conference. And this, diplomatic, uh, this preparatory co uh, committee of the diplomatic conf uh, conference will meet from the 11th to the 13th September of this year. So what's up for negotiation? Up for negotia negu negotiation is a text of an international legal instrument relating to intellectual property, uh, genetic resource, traditional knowledge associated with genetic resources. And um, it's all about the establishment of a mandatory patent disclosure requirement. It would require patent appli appli applicants to disclose the country of origin or source of the genetic resources. And um, there is a, uh, the pre in preparation of this, uh, of this, um, this conference, um, there's already a text um, introduced or the text, text is circling around. It is commonly called the chair's text in which uh, those um, requirements are already set down and which is um, open for further discussions during the diplomatic conference. So next step, we will see, or, and we are very exciting what will happen next week and the week after, what will happen in the diplomatic conference in the year 2024. Um, proponents, proponents argue that this new patent disclosure requirement will make it possible to monitor the contribution of genetic resources to patentable inventions and to actually promote the fair and equitable sharing of uh, um, benefits. So we will see what happens. We, maybe you are interested to follow this up. And I am at the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention.